Becky Page and Angie Buya are counselors at uh, Sparrow House Counseling, and we had a chance to sit down recently together, and I was just sharing with them some of the main concerns of our parents, topics that come up, and based on our family, excuse me, our counselors within the district, uh, image and perfection and body image specifically come high on the list. It's, it's one of the most concerning topics on all of our campuses, elementary through high school. And as we got to talking about that, um, Angie and Becky both feel very passionately about this based on their own experience. Um, they both are Texans. Um, let's see, Angie began practicing in 2001 for her counseling and Becky in 2004. Both went to Texas Tech and then on to Dallas Theological Seminary for their master's in counseling. And then they've just been um, pursuing their passions and helping other families, individuals, as well as marriages and children in their quest to become healthy, happy, responsible um, citizens and um, in their relationships with one another. So I think you will enjoy them a lot. They, they speak honestly and authentically. We're going to have them speak and share their, their presentation, and then we're going to open the floor up for questions and answers and really encourage you all to you know, write down on, on your handouts there if you have any questions that come to mind through the course of the program. So thank you all for coming. It's my honor to um, introduce both of these ladies, and Becky Page is going to start us off. Thank you, Becky. Thank you. Well, I'm Becky Page. I'm really grateful to be here with you guys this morning. I'm going to just start off with a little bit of vulnerability, authenticity, that I have been nervous big time, especially about coming to talk about perfectionism, performance and body image. I want you guys to know one of the reasons why Angie and I feel so passionately about this is because it's not only that we've been here in the Park Cities for over the past decade and working with families who are wrestling through these issues, but because these specific issues are a huge part of our own past. Um, I'm going to start and just share with you a little bit about myself. I am the adult daughter of a Southern Baptist preacher. <laughs> I've been in recovery for that for a couple of decades now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but seriously, growing up, I felt that idea of kind of life in the fishbowl, like everyone was, was watching, and not in a paranoia sense, but just everyone was kind of observing, how's she doing, how's she doing, okay. Um, I started to develop really early on, and a little bit from my dad, who was a, a pastor, but a workaholic, and definitely um, addicted to perfection and performance himself, the idea of just keep working harder, and put out that good face, and look good, and, and it was always subtle, he was, he loved me very much, but it was a pretty clear message of people are watching, people are so I held on to that for a long time, and as a kid, it worked for me. We're going to talk a little bit of why, about why perfection, perfectionism and performance works, but how it worked for me was I was kind of good at performing, and I liked the praise that came from doing something well. It felt neat when people responded, good job, good job. So I started to really be drawn towards the, the praise and the encouragement that I would receive from that. Fast forward to high school. Um, when I was younger, I was, I was sort of rigid. I, I wouldn't want to try something that I didn't feel that I naturally immediately excelled at. I don't know if you've ever been coloring with your kids and they go, well, you, mommy, you draw this and you draw it. Like, oh, no, you try. No, I'm not good at that. I don't want to do it. You do it. It was a little bit like that. I wasn't very interested in, in the areas that I didn't excel in. I became rigid there, but I really wanted to push towards the areas that I got praise in. Fast forward to high school, very involved. Um, in many ways, I would have been outwardly uh, involved in, like, captain of the soccer team, president of the student body, and of course going to youth group because I did not have a choice there. Um, very active in young life, very active in Bible studies and whatnot, but then secretly really began to struggle with drinking because then, gosh, there's this whole other group of people that I need to please and perform for. So I was really motivated to kind of carry the masks you know that idea that you're on your way somewhere, whether it's to church or school, you're in the car fighting, yelling at each other, you get out, hello, good morning, hello, how are you? That was very evident in my life. So uh, you heard Laura say that I went to Texas Tech University, as well did Angie, and you know no one drinks at Texas Tech. <laughs> so I went further into really struggling with, okay, here's my public sorority and academic self, and then here's my secret shadow self that's also seeking to please all these other people got out of college, 
And at that point, I think outwardly you would have thought that I was very confident, very capable, uh, well-spoken, intelligent, and I want you to know that inside I was very fearful, extremely anxious, began to struggle with panic attacks, began to struggle with depression. I was often exhausted. Um, and I didn't want anyone to know, because that was embarrassing. I was ashamed of how I felt about myself secretly. But I would look in the mirror at night and think, I hate you. I was on diet pills. I was training for marathons. I was a youth pastor. I was working for a little ministry called K-Life. And so I was hanging out with high school kids all day long and putting out that outward front, but then inwardly very depressed, which led to the great downfall, summer of 2002, I unfortunately planned my own suicide and didn't tell anyone. And it was so shocking to me. I know that sounds pretty blunt, but that's how low I was. That's how exhausted I had gotten. I just did not feel like I could keep going. And it had been probably over a year of struggling with secret shame about who I was inwardly and who I was putting out, out there to the public. Well, that was the great thing because that led to resigning from youth ministry, which was a long time in coming. Um, it led to getting into great therapy. It eventually led to work in some 12-step program. And it led to Dallas Seminary, where ironically I went and got my master's in counseling. So that is the background for me of, of how this sort of snowballed into <coughs> severe clinical depression. And that's why I'm feeling really passionate about wanting to inspire you guys to address it in your own life so that you can therefore be equipped to address it in the lives of your kids. Let's see. Oh, these quotes suddenly got super small. I don't know. If you can't see them here, you can see them on your page. But the first quote from Kobe Bryant, that's for you, one dad who came in. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, you know, you see he says he's chasing perfection. And I love that idea because it's, it's unattainable. It sounds like the all-American idea of you know, here's this elite athlete, he's chasing perfection. But I really like what Michael J. Fox says, that I'm careful not to confuse excellence with perfection. Excellence I can reach for, perfection is God's business. Let's look at perfection defined. We're going to give you guys today some um, traditional definitions and then the urban dictionary definition, which we always love. But perfection is something that cannot be improved. It's free from flaw or default. Don't know about you, that is not me. The Urban Dictionary definition says it's an impossibility and it cannot be reached ever. Um, if you have not read Brene Brown, you're gonna get tired of me talking about her today, but she's good stuff. She says, perfectionism is a self-destructive and addictive belief system that fuels this primary thought. If I look perfect and do everything perfectly, I can avoid or minimize the painful feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. One of the things we have to be so careful about with perfectionism in our own lives and then even how we talk to our children is that what's really being attempted is almost like a, a shield. Brene Brown calls it the 20-ton shield that we carry around trying to protect ourselves from judgment, blame, and shame. Why it works, and we put that in quotes, because let's, let's be real, I, I hope everyone in this room is connected to the idea of this is a very real issue. And the reason why is because it feels sometimes like it works. It functions as a motivator. You know, when, when we push ourselves or we push other people, especially our children, towards perfection, it feels like a good motivator at first. Do it better, do it better, do it one more time, you can do it again. It focuses on accomplishment versus progress or process. Now, we are really accomplishment-based society. We like to um, evaluate, judge, scale things, score things. And so a lot of times what gets lost then is the process or the journey that someone is on. The fact that failure might be a part of that. But we like accomplishment, so perfectionism seems to work for us. It propels people to seek excellence. That sounds so nice. I want to seek excellence. Shoot for the stars and you'll get the moon. Angie had this idea. It's such a great saying. You know, it basically says just keep pushing just a little farther and then maybe you'll get the moon thrown in too. But here's why it doesn't work, which we call the shadow message. The core of perfectionism is fear. 
I want you to think about that for just a minute. When I have clients in, in my office and they're struggling with perfectionism or performance or control, which I, I think most of us moms probably have a tendency towards, when we really get down to, okay, what's the driving emotion going on for you now? Typically, it is always fear. The fear, whether it is the fear of someone's disappointment or disapproval with me, whether it's the fear of how I perceive myself or the fear of failure. The goal of perfectionism is to overcome shame. The problem with that is that shame is an emotion that happens inside of me. So these outward attempts by the attempt to, to look better, to be skinnier, to perform better out in public, these are outward attempts to fix an emotion that is occurring inside of me. They don't work. I have to take on my own emotions if I'm gonna change that. And the goal always moves. Isn't that a shame? It's always the next best person to come along. It just sets the bar even higher, even higher. I remember growing up feeling like, oh my gosh, this bar just keeps getting higher and higher. Okay, you did awesome. You got an A minus on that paper. Let's see how you can do next time. It just kept going higher, higher. The focus inevitably is on that which is lacking. And boy, isn't that true. Perfectionism doesn't tell you, great job on that. It tells you, mm, but this. It creates rigidity and avoidance towards challenging tasks. I brought that up earlier in regards to my daughter. Um, one of the ways you can tell if your child is already beginning to struggle with some perfectionism is when they get really rigid about not wanting to try something that they're not immediately excellent at. And ironically, when I see that playing out most with my children, it's when I'm aware of it going on with myself as well. That I don't really want to try something, and I'm probably outwardly speaking negatively about it, because it's not an area that I feel immediately good at. And then here's the biggest reason why. It's a myth. The idea that any of us can achieve perfectionism is just a big old lie. Uh, here's Brene Brown again. She says, crazy busy is a great armor. It's a great way for numbing. What a lot of us do is that we stay so busy and so out in front of our life that the truth of how we're feeling and what we really need can't catch up with us. That sums up probably um, years 17 through 28 for me. Ed Sheeran says, I can tell you the key to success. I can't tell you the key to success, but the key to failure is trying to please anyone. I'm not going to make you raise your hands, but can you just kind of barely nod if you can relate to that idea of wanting to please everyone? It's exhausting. Okay, traditional definition of performance is that it's an activity or person or group uh, does to entertain an audience, to carry out, accomplish, or fulfill, or to do an action that requires a skill. The Urban, Dic the Urban Dictionary calls it a showcase. It says it's the one thing that sums up all the hard work, time, and thought put into a work or beauty and art. A breathtaking and nerve-wracking experience. Here's why performance seems to work. And, and when we talk about performance, I want you to think of the idea of performance-based living or the idea that I'm performing outwardly to get someone else's acceptance or approval. There's a tangible goal, typically. And, and now, if it's about a person, the tangible goal is to get you to like me. There's often positive feedback from others. This was one of the reasons why this has been such a struggle for me personally is because of all the praise I got from performance-based living. It requires and highlights preparation. This sounds good. And it provides something to review. However, it becomes a way to measure one's worth. I want to ask you guys a question today regarding this idea of worth. Um, if you can think back to when the, the very first moment that you held your first child. If you can think back to that moment, the first time you've got that child in your arms. I'm curious, how much was that child worth to you in that moment? Like a thousand, hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> put a price tag on it. And, and then what had they done to deserve that worth in that moment? Just nothing. Just being alive. And we get so confused on that as every day passes by and we think that there's something we can do or not do to add or to subtract from our worth. You and I are infinitely valuable just because we are. So when we get hung up on performance, it is a real messed up translation of that. It tends to say, I can build or detract from my worth based on what I do. That is just a big old fat lie. 
it gets fixated on others versus self so that I'm now basing my worth on how you perceive me or how you perceive me or what you say I did versus myself, how I think I did. What I can say about that, how I can affirm me. It always requires comparison in some form. Anytime I think I'm looking good, someone else prettier and cuter comes and stands next to me. <laughs> Which is good for me. It may not be accurate or reliable. It's, in fact, let's say it's rarely accurate or reliable. Uh, it fosters a culture of judgment. Angie will probably have some thoughts about this later. But have you ever been, um, had a friend who every time you walked up, they kind of did the size up number? Mm -hmm. Hi. <laughs> We're all like that on the inside. I have to force myself. Don't drop those eyes. Don't drop those <laughs> eyes. It leads to exhaustion. And I want to say, too, that exhaustion will lead to depression. I guarantee you. And it perpetuates self-doubt. You live in a constant state of wondering, how am I doing? I'm not sure of how I'm doing. You know, they say the codependent handshake is, hey, how am I doing? <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to pass it off to Angie for a little bit, and she's going to talk to you about eating disorders, and then I will be back. I am the prettier, cuter one now coming to stand next to her. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Or am I? Judgment. Okay, so we, we set you up with performance and perfectionism because in reality, both of those concepts, driving forces, cultural phenomenons, whatever you want to call them, absolutely tie into contributing to an eating disorder. There are also things that I think we tend to look at going, okay, I don't want to really talk about perfection or performance, or maybe I just want to talk about how... I'm getting over my perfectionism versus realizing it really is a way of life. These are not things that we're going to, we're not going to perfect the art of no longer being perfect. If you think about that and think about how often we might strive to do that, right? I will now no longer be perfect. I will be perfectly imperfect. And so what happens is we, we find ourselves striving for something again that's unattainable versus being able to really talk through validate, experience our life, whatever that might be. So it does tie into eating disorders. I'm going to not really go over the criteria for the eating disorders listed. I am going to highlight some. They are in one of your handouts. So if you want to find those, I think it's behind the normal eating handout. Is that correct? We have a long list of symptoms. Most of you are highly educated women who know how to use the website web. The web. <laughs> I don't use the web much. <laughs> I don't use the Facebook either. So um, I'm real out of touch. I don't work with teenagers anymore. Because they, you talk to me about things I don't know. And, and I'm just like, I want to know what your feelings are. But there, anyway, these things are all on websites. There's multiple websites. We have your resource page listed. I've listed most of the organizations simply by their acronyms, such as ANAD, or NETA, which is on your resource page. But you can go and look up any of these. A great website is Something Fishy. Um, it talks about how to assess. It's going to have some great tools if you, if you need some more information. Um, but this list on your handout is a compilation of pretty much every sign or symptom. I want to highlight a few that I think are, would be most pertinent for you guys as moms and dads, um, or mom and dad. As, um, we've got the dad here, which is awesome. Um, the biggest one that I think these are external changes would be wearing big or baggy clothes or dressing in layers to hide body, shape, and or weight loss. A lot of times this will happen when somebody you love maybe starts losing weight, they're going to start dressing more to show off their body, but then there'll be a flip when their weight tips to a place where they know is possibly unhealthy, and they're going to want to start hiding it. Um, so you, if your child is wearing baggy clothes, it doesn't mean they have an eating disorder. It is something to pay attention to because it is one of our big markers. It's, it's very, it's basically a tell, an easy tell. Another one to highlight is an obsession with calories and fat content of foods. When I'm sitting with a young lady who's had an eating disorder, um, they can tell me the fat content of the burrito that I had at lunch. And I, I don't know what the fat content anymore because I'm 20 years um, symptom-free and in recovery from my eating disorder, so I don't count calories anymore. Numbers fly out of my head, thank, thank goodness. But they usually know. And you'll notice that your daughter or son might look at a can of soup and 
the grocery store and be able to say, oh, this is that kind of soup and it's fat free. Or, oh, that, you know, that only has 100 calories. Or let's do this one. They're going to be talking more and more about fat and calorie content. What that means is the more they're talking about it, multiply that by 25, 30%, that's how much they're thinking about it. What you're hearing is the tip of an iceberg. So the language they're using tells you how much the obsession is. Another one I want to highlight is down on the list. It says use or hiding use of diet pills, la laxatives, Ipecac, or enemas. If you find diet pills in your kid's bathroom, that's a, that is something to immediately be addressed. If you find laxatives that you have not purchased for them, which we we'll come back to that, please don't purchase those for your child. There's really good things to help with constipation. Um, please address those things immediately because if, they're ha if they've already started hiding them, they've moved into a pretty significant or severe dangerous zone. <laughs> Um, looking for unusual food rituals. Uh, if they eat the same things in order, they start having anxiety if their food touches. These are things that you want to start looking for. Any kind of strange ritual. Cutting food a certain way at a certain angle, all sorts of things like that. Or I would say strange foods. Mustard is really not a salad dressing. And that's one of the biggest things that people who struggle with disordered eating do is put their mustard on their salad. So if you start noticing some strange food patterns, pay attention to that. Hiding food. If you walk in and they've stuck some wrappers or candy bars under their mattress, again, these are things you want to address and notice. Very common. Spending time on websites that promote unhealthy ways to lose weight and reading books about weight loss and eating disorders. Again, this just speaks to their obsession. They're going to be looking and looking and looking for information. So if you see those things, begin to address it. Frequent sore throats or swollen glands. Um, that goes back to the bulimia side, the person who may be vomiting as a weight management or weight control. Loss of their menstrual cycle, constipation or incontinence. All of those have to do with the damage done to the body from using diet pills and or laxatives or restriction. So paying attention to their physical symptoms. Um, here's one we were, are gonna, we've talked about this morning, perfect, perfectionistic personality. If your kid is a high achiever and all of a sudden they start focusing or assigning to food a lot of energy and attention, something to pay attention to. Because people who have performance and perfectionism tend to be really good at eating disorders. And with, if they're not really good at an eating disorder such as anorexia, then they're going to shift to bulimia because bulimia doesn't require as much perfectionism as anorexia does. It's much more impulsive. And then the binge eating one, I want you to look at under that list, I want to highlight the chronic dieting. People who have binge eating disorder are typically the first ones on the newest and latest and greatest diet. Again, we have the hiding food in strange places, blaming failure on their weight in some way. And then the last page is a newer eating disorder or disordered concept. These are not on the slides. These are in your handouts. Called orthorexia. And the orthorexia, is, it's new. We had a big, we have a new diagnostic manual. We had a big argument um, in the medical and mental health field as to whether to include it or not. But orthorexia is very, very popular, especially as we've got the rise of organic and healthy eating. And so take a look at that and recognize that this one is the, probably the most subtle form of an eating disorder and can easily tip into a much more severe eating disorder such as anorexia. Orthorexia would probably be step one to an anorexic mindset. Okay, so that's on your handout. I'm going to now talk through eating disorders 101. I'm going to talk about contributing factors, things that typically we see happening before a person develops an eating disorder. So let me talk a little about the general statistics. Before we hit the contributing factors, there's 24 million people of all ages and genders suffering from an eating disorder today. That's a reported statistic. So what you need to know about stats is if it's, it doesn't talk about what's not reported. So usually we tend to double things. That's just a reported number. Only one in 10 people seek treatment. And out of the 10 people who seek treatment, only 35% actually get help 
from a professional that specializes in an eating disorder or a treatment center that specializes. That's, that's actually pretty scary because what happens is they may not actually get to address some of the things that really are the underlying issues of an eating disorder, such as the attitudes, the thoughts, the drive for perfectionism, the drive for performance. 86% report an onset of an eating disorder by the age of 20. So if you have a child under the age of 18, that puts them in the prime category for developing an eating disorder. 25% of college age women, that's one fourth, use binging and purging to control their weight. 25%. If I had a chance and I could pull the room quietly, I probably would find out that 25% of the population here used binging and purging in college. I know I did. And so we know that's, and again, that's the reported statistic. So if we double it, it's probably higher. 10% of eating disorders are male. However, they're the least likely to seek help. Do you guys know why? They're men. They're men. <laughs> they, they don't want to seek help, right? <laughs> eating disorders is a, a girl's disease. And they're terrified that somebody's going to shame them about this. And most often, dads really don't know how to talk to their sons about their body image or if they notice eating disorder behaviors because it's typically been a female issue. We are seeing a rise in males with eating disorders. We're seeing a rise in males who are receiving plastic surgery. We are also in the treatment world desperately trying to figure out how to catch up with what we're seeing and provide very good treatment that's specific for males. I hate to say it, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting there, which is I'm really glad about. But it is, it is much more difficult for young men and boys to talk about their body shame than it is for a little girl. Because little girls, and women tend to talk about dieting. When's the last time you went to a function with a bunch of women? What was one of the topics? Exercise. Diet and exercise, right off the bat. What you should and shouldn't eat, and maybe who made those brownies, and don't they look good, but I really shouldn't have one. I had one yesterday. <laughs> what we do. We're kind of crazy about that. See, you can laugh at it. I laugh at it. I just, you know. I'm like, great, if you don't eat your brownie, I'll take it home and put it in the freezer. I'm going to eat it tomorrow. Breakfast, I don't know. <laughs> All right, and 1% of the female population have anorexia. Anorexia really is probably the core. They call it the ABCs. It starts with anorexia. Um, I always joke, joke that I'm a big failure at anorexia, so I became bulimic. Um, I didn't like being hungry <laughs> at all. <laughs> so I just went to the other extreme. That's the B, so anorexia, that's what most people try to start with. I've never met a, a young person or an adult who said, you know, I really started with bulimia. They usually start with the anorexic mindset, because anorexia is born out of the perfection and performance, right? Tying that back in. We want to perform, we want to do well. Anorexia in the community of eating disorders is also the queen bee of eating disorders. Um, there's a lot of comparison that takes place in that culture. But most people, when they fail at anorexia, because you're either going to starve to death and die, or eventually you're going to start eating, they move on to bulimia, which is the binge purge. You can purge in four different types, exercise, laxatives, restricting, or fasting. And then when that begins to break down, because oftentimes that will break down, at some point you'll get tired of the purging behaviors, exhaustion, as Becky talked about, under performance. You fail, the goal is continuing to move then you will eventually just move to what they call the C, which is compulsive overeating. These are our binge eaters. And oftentimes when I have somebody who is overweight or obese in my office, it is actually because they're an anorexic thinker trapped in a compulsive overeater's body because they are still trying to perform and get back to that restrictiveness, get back to that goal of being able to eat a certain amount of calories a day that they can't sustain life on. So those are some statistics. I have some other not so fun facts that you can take a look at that are you know, really exciting, like only 7% of women ages 18 to 34 are gonna be able to have the body of a catwalk model. 1% will have the body of a supermodel. Yet who's in all our magazines? It'd be unattainable. <laughs> that 50% plus report feeling worse about themselves after looking at a 
uh, woman's magazine, I think it's for two minutes. If you've ever just looked in a magazine, if you notice your mood may go down a little bit. Because again, we've got this unattainable goal, which by the way is airbrushed. If you've ever seen the Dove PSA, it's a great one where they show a woman and how they airbrush it. And we never see a picture that hadn't been touched up. It, it doesn't exist. So. Um, so there's some more fun facts, but those are the general statistics. Moving on to contributing factors. The number one contributing factor, and before, here's my disclaimer, I want you to hear this. I do not professionally nor personally believe you can prevent an eating disorder in a loved one. So the goal of educating you about contributing factors today is not so that you can guarantee that you will not have a child who struggles with an eating disorder. Instead, it's to be able to say, you know, if my kid struggles, I'm going to be aware of what might be contributing to it. Maybe I'll have a little more headspace because I won't be so focused on trying to stop it. I'll be able to be a part of the process and find the solution. Okay? So these things are contributing factors. They are not causes. This is not a formula. It is not a, if you never talk about diets, you won't have a child with an eating disorder. They are simply things that we know across the board in people who have eating disorders that these, these are present. So the first one is diets. I have obviously never met a person with an eating disorder that didn't start on a diet. Um, the dieting industry in our country is out of control. There's a new diet every day that promises something better. But diet defined, it's the kinds of food that a person or community habitually eats. A special course to which one restricts itself. So that's what a diet is. And what we see in our culture is that we get very focused and obsessed on being on the next diet. Everybody on some level does it. Another fun fact, at any time, any given, any venue, 50% of the female population will be on a diet. I won't ask you to raise your hand how many of you are currently on a diet, but we know it's present. And the key word in that is restriction. Diets are where you pull a food out and you say this food is bad and we will not eat it. That is a diet. So if there's anything out there saying, we're not a diet, but you can't eat this, that's not a true statement, because a diet always involves restriction. So that is a big contributing factor. Kids who diet early have higher chances of obesity later in life. Kids who diet early start to mess with their metabolism and their body functioning early on. So diets is probably the number one contributing factor. Number two is depression and anxiety. The majority of kids also are young adults or women that I see who have an eating disorder oftentimes had undiagnosed or untreated anxiety in childhood. I know that for me personally, I had my first panic attack in the third grade, and I remember it clearly. But we didn't talk about it. I didn't know what had happened. And so my anxiety went untreated as a child. So when I discovered an eating disorder could help me feel better and give me something, I latched on immediately. So we know that untreated depression and anxiety is another contributing factor. Over 50% of eating disorders meet the criteria for major depressive disorder. It's a high number. It's what we call comorbidity. Two-thirds of those with eating disorders also suffer from anxiety at some point. And the most common anxiety disorder to co-occur with eating disorders is OCD. So if you are noticing any of those traits, those are good things to begin to talk about with your child or even your spouse, partner, doctor, beginning to think how do we come up with some solution about anxiety and depression. Family history. This is another contributing behavior. Dieting behaviors in family also it's an amazing statistical piece of information just sitting in the chair. The majority of girls with eating disorders, I always do a pre-interview with parents. Almost, I'm gonna guess, I haven't done the statistics, but 90, 95% just from my own practice, the moms are either chronic dieters or have had an eating disorder in college that they never got treatment for. So maybe they stopped the eating disorder behavior, but they never got treatment. It is shocking when you when I think about those numbers that I'm now at this point dealing with second and even third generation eating disorders um, kids it's just passed right down through the history 
And maybe mom's not talking about it out loud, but kids are like a little, you know, they're emotional vacuum cleaners. They know things that are going on without knowing. They're, it's fascinating to watch. So we've got the mom factor. I will say that psychology tends to like to throw moms under the bus. <laughs> I don't, especially since I am one. Um, but we know that moms are very influential. Moms typically plan the menus. Mom you know, we're the ones going to the grocery store. We're the ones that are thinking about what we're going to eat. We're packing lunches. All those fun things. So moms are influential with food. And so we know that two-thirds, or 60%, 66% of kids, they hear their moms talking about their weight. Just talking about their weight. Yet, and maybe talking about it usually in a negative way, right? I mean, when's the last time you looked in front of the mirror and thought, man, my body is awesome. <laughs> right, the laughter tells me, probably not, recently. So usually they're hearing it in a negative light, maybe the next diet you need to go on or how you feel because you missed your workout, all those fun things. So they hear mom complaining about their weight, yet 68% of teenagers, so the number's actually higher, they would describe their mom's weight as normal. So immediately as a kid, they're hearing you say something that's negative, and you are the person that they look to as their mark, as their comparison, first and foremost. And they're hearing you say, wow, you know, my stomach is bloated, or ooh, I need to lose some weight and get back to my jeans that I could wear last year. They hear this, and they're thinking, wow, she's really pretty. I don't love her, and I think she looks great. And so they get a mixed message, because somebody that they believe is really pretty and they think looks great is saying how they aren't very pretty and they don't really look that great. And that is part of what begins to create that confusion. If mom isn't looking that good and I think she's awesome, what about me? So that's one of the big history, historical parts, so dieting behaviors. I've already addressed this. There's untreated eating disorders in mom and dad. We're beginning, like I said, now to see dads who really have had their own eating disorder that has not been treated and or OCD behaviors that have simply attached or assigned to food. There's alcoholism in the family history. There's a strong correlation between alcoholism in any part of the family and a subsequent eating disorder in one of the children or grandchildren. Troubled family relationships, kind of self-explanatory, and then rules regarding emotional expression. What that simply means is there's certain feelings that maybe aren't accepted in the family, good girls aren't angry, um, boys don't cry, get over your shame, whatever that message might be, just don't feel it. And if you do feel it, feel it and struggle well, which is always one of my, very curious about that statement, struggle well. And if I'm struggling, it's usually messy. <laughs> and I'm just trying to get through it. So, but we tend to have that message. Okay, number four, culture and subculture. Big contributing factor, obviously, media and peer pressure. Little girls will talk about diets. Boys, not so much, because boys don't talk about this many things, but they will make fun of each other. If your little boy is getting made fun of for his weight, you want to pay attention to that, or being smaller, or maybe he hadn't hit his growth spurt yet. That's a, that can be a big part of the peer pressure. Cultural norms and views about beauty and health, which are often mixed messages. I mean, you see beautiful people eating hamburgers on Burger King commercials. That's a mixed message. I mean, it's just a mixed message. Or you see a diet commercial. How many times have you watched, if you ever watch, it's fascinating, a diet commercial and then a food commercial and then a diet commercial and then a food commercial. Those are mixed messages immediately. And by the time I, it's on the fact sheet, I don't want to misquote it, it's something like by the time a kid is 18, they've seen 250,000 commercials. That's a massive amount. And that's not even counting the web where they're looking for what they want to look for. So we have mixed messages in our, in our media. Be healthy, but be thin. Eat, but stay perfect. Those are very, very mixed. Um, personality is an obvious contributing factor. Um, we call it the tortoise and the hare. If you remember that from childhood uh, literature, the tortoise tends to be the anorexic thinker, steady, OCD, rigid. When things get scary, they pull in. The hare is your bulimic, impulsive, jump before you think. They're going to be the ones that are 
struggling with their bulimia, but also drinking, possibly criminal activity, all sorts of fun things. The hair is highly impulsive. So you've got your personality factors. Um, being a performer perfectionist, a low view of self, meaning they just don't think very highly of themselves at all, that you might hear them run themselves down pretty regularly, especially if they fail. And then I call it the disease of the EST, that desire to be the prettiest, richest, thinnest, funniest, just fill it in, the best, the EST, and wherever they are. That's a contributing factor to their personality. We also have biology, which ties into psychology, such as depression and anxiety. People who have untreated anxiety, like I stated before, oftentimes that anxiety will then attach to food because it's something tangible. Developing a phobia of food. Brain functioning and hormone changes. Women, um, they studied this, women go through a hormone change pretty much every day of their life, which is awesome. <laughs> Men have four major hormone changes throughout their entire life, which is not fair. So girls, obviously learning how to handle their hormones is a big part of the conversation, the fluid dialogue about what's happening to their body. But when a little girl is prepubescent, their body's going to start changing and thickening. But oftentimes people see that as weight gain and start to freak out. So that's a big one. Puberty is another big change where your hormones are changing. Obviously pregnancy, your hormones are changing. And then menopause is another time where we see people are most at risk for developing disordered patterns. Um, the possibility of different chemicals in brain that control hunger, digestion, and appetite are unbalanced. We're, we're researching that and they're noticing trends in different chemicals and how brains pop, that they process the ability to regulate their appetite. And then lack of respect for the genetic uniqueness regarding body type. We don't all have the same shoe type, right? I'm a seven, what are you? Eight. You're an eight? Okay, well I'm better, because you're a seven, right? <laughs> I guess I'm seven. You, oh, she used to be a seven. You graduated. <laughs> you've perfected. You've perfected the shoe. Then I had babies. And then oh, they grew. Yes, there you go. Hormone changes. Body changes. But our feet are actually genetically imprinted. We tend to stay in a range. We don't bind our feet. We don't try to make them different. Yet, how often do we look at a certain body type and say that's the body type we're supposed to have? when we don't honor that bodies come in different shapes and sizes and that our bodies function the very best at whatever it was genetically imprinted to be. We do not respect that in our culture. We say, you need to look this way, you need to look that way, and that really can mess with your genetics. It is important because when kids are in their adolescent and developing years, the more they mess with their body, the more they're messing actually with their brain chemistry and they're actually messing with their genetic imprint. And it can take a lot longer for their body to be able to recover and come back to that stability point. So outcomes of untreated eating disorders, there are significant health consequences. Um, the worst of it obviously being death, but we know that lots and lots of health issues come up from an eating disorder that's untreated. Um, poor quality of life, it's very difficult to enjoy your life when what you're thinking about is what you've just eaten or what you will eat or what you won't eat or where you're going to eat or who's going to be with you and how you're going to eat without anybody looking at you. Poor quality of life. Disrupted finances. Um, depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation. Oftentimes there's a development of other addictions. So maybe I stop my bulimia or maybe I've stopped starving myself, but now I've picked up diet pills, and then I move on to amphetamines, and then before I know it, I'm on crystal meth. Kids, teenagers, love to be ADD, because what do the ADD meds do for them? They suppress their appetite. They love ADD meds. ADD medications, biologically, in their component, is an amphetamine-based drug. What is an amphetamine? Crystal meth amphetamine. This is why we're seeing addiction going up higher and higher in the amphetamine-based drugs. So pay attention to that. If your kid really thinks they're ADD, go to a person who's actually qualified to diagnose them as ADD, which is not, being, is not a diagnosis online. <laughs> Thank you. And when untreated, it is always progressive. 
even if attaching to other compulsive behaviors or disorders. So, nice talk, right? How you feeling? Are you excited? Glad you have a daughter. <laughs> Glad that you're a woman. It's scary. And again, I want to reiterate, this is why it is not about prevention for you guys. It is about knowing the information and learning as a parent, how do you model some of the things that we've talked about this morning? How do you model this idea of being countercultural, not striving for only being perfectionistic? not being the over performer, not being the mom that always is on the next diet. How do you get to do that? Because that's really the best gift you can give your kid. And if they develop an eating disorder, then like I said, you're gonna have a lot more headspace to connect with them differently. So, a new paradigm, this is one of my favorite quotes, I don't actually know where it came from, I worked for a treatment center and they say it quite a bit there, and um, so I'm going to assume it's from the recovery community. But it, it says that your actions speak so loud I can't hear what you say. And as a parent, if I had known that before I became a parent, I may have reconsidered this whole parenting thing. <laughs> because that's the truth of parenting. My actions tell my child way more about my value system than my words. So we're going to talk a little bit about some action steps that maybe you guys can take, some solution that we have seen that works. We'll let Becky start with that. Thank you, Ange. Okay. On specific action ideas, we do have on the back of your fun fact sheet, there are some questions to ask yourself. So we're going to start first with being able to evaluate your words, your attitudes, and your actions. I do want to say, and this is not just because I am a local therapist, but if you are finding, even from some of the emotions coming up as you listen to this talk, if you're finding that you might have some avenues in your own life or some history that you have yet to explore, I would encourage you, you can only take your children so far down the road as you've walked yourself. So the very best thing to do, and, and we say this a lot even in counseling, is if you're looking to get your child help and you have not yet sought help for yourself, it's sort of like when you're on the airplane and they say, okay, when the oxygen mask drops down, put the mask on yourself first and then help administer it to your child. It goes the same way in counseling. If you've got uncharted territory that you feel led, okay, this might be an area that I need to work on, be brave. What a gift to yourself and then definitely to your child. So as you evaluate your words, your attitude, and your actions, here are some questions. First of all, are you practicing authenticity? That's a buzzword in our community right now. What that means is that my insides match, match my outsides. So when I'm feeling um, blue, when I'm feeling anxious, when I'm feeling stressed out, annoyed, I'm gonna talk about that in a gentle way. Uh, it's really important for my child to see, okay, mommy struggles. Mommy has a hard time. This is, how, this is how we express emotions. That's authentic. Now that is not using my child as my um, confidant, my own therapist. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna try to imagine that there's only so much weight she can hold for me, and, and not for me, but for me to demonstrate, here's how we talk about feelings. Here's how we talk about hard things. Are you practicing vulnerability? Are you able, let's, let's not even start with kids, are you able in your own community, in your own friendships, to be really vulnerable? Just say, I might need some help here. Or I've been thinking a lot about this, I was wondering if you had any feedback. I will say, be careful. There are safe people, and I think everyone here knows, there are unsafe people. So be very careful who you're vulnerable with. But if you are finding in your life that there's really no one who knows some of the secret scripts going on in your head, that's a problem. That got, harkens back to what Angie said about how you don't ever have to talk about it. Your little, what do you call it, emotional vacuum cleaner? I <laughs> love that. He or she will pick up on it. Evaluating your words. Do you talk a lot about food? Do you talk a lot about being fat-free? Do you talk a lot about being fat? Uh, I was telling Angie on the way here that my daughter has started talk, referring to one of her puffy coats as it's a fat coat. And my first reaction wanted to be like, no! <laughs> We don't say that word. But then, um, what do you mean, honey? Can you tell me more about what that means? And as I was listening to her, she I will say, she's five years old. She is already using that phrase. So just to feel good about yourself, the therapist kid is already using that language. Um, but really being able to dialogue with your kid. 
What do you think that means? When you hear them talking about how someone looks, and you've got to start with your own words. I love this one. Do you should on yourself? That's not a typo. We use that saying a lot. Don't should on yourself. Oh, I should be doing I really, really shouldn't have eaten that. Oh, I really, really should get up tomorrow and go for a run. Oh, I really should get back to tennis. Evaluating your attitudes. Do I believe in good and bad foods? Oh, this is such a bummer right now. Um, because I know I'm, I'm very aware of the push right now towards organic, towards healthy. We go nuts with that healthy phrase. It, it's just a conglomerate of so many different attitudes. Um, do I talk about bad foods a lot? Do I judge overweight people, starting with myself? What do I do when I fail or when others fail? How is my response there? And then evaluating your actions. Where do my actions differ from my words? This is a hard one, especially for mothers. You know, we want so badly for these things to get ingrained in our children, but a lot of times they're things that we ourselves haven't embraced. Okay, now, being aware, we're going back to the PowerPoint, being aware of signs, symptoms, and concerns. That's part of why we've given you all this information that we don't have time to touch on all of it today. We just want to get it into your hands. Awareness is the key. You cannot fix anything without first being aware of it. And then we really believe you don't really fix this side of eternity. You don't fix much. You might grow and change, but struggling is what happens here on earth. Uh, what about exercise as fun? instead of a punishment of some sort that you go do every day? Or what about it as stress relief or mental health versus weight loss or toning? What about just exercising because I feel better? And then Angie's going to start to talk with you now about having a variety of food. Um, I think about exercise is fun. I have a, a boy who's four and a half, and he, it, he runs everywhere. How many of you guys have boys? Yeah, I mean, he runs everywhere. And I thought, well, I used to probably do that. And now I, you know, have to go walk on a treadmill for 25 minutes. And, you know, I'm like, what would happen if I just started running around my house? I'm going to go do the dishes. <laughs> you know, come on, let's go run. Let's go run and make your bed. I, I would be exercising, and I might have a little more fun. There's an old Friends episode where Phoebe runs like a crazy person, if, if you're old enough to remember Friends. But <laughs> it's great. And I think we forget. We don't play dodgeball. We don't just run around outside and, and, and try to kick the ball before a kid does because we don't consider that exercise. Um, it may not be fun to clean, but cleaning is also, we don't think about that. But doing some, some work, some labor. We put exercise, we're one of the only cultures that put exercise over here as a thing we do separately. And unfortunately, we're teaching our kids that versus just teaching them to have a fun, balanced life and, and move. Just have some fun. Provide a variety of food. This is one of the best things you can do, that there really aren't foods that are off limits. I know that's crazy talk. And yes, I'm talking about things like Pop-Tarts. <laughs> <laughs> tricks. I bought some tricks on Tuesday. It'll be, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll eat it before my son gets to it. But we, we do these things. There's no foods that are off limits. I know, it's crazy. Because our culture doesn't agree with that. There's some of you in there that, that don't agree with me on that. And that's okay. What we know is that when you provide a variety of foods, kids begin to figure out that foods actually are not off limits. And that food is food is food is food. And that when their body is telling them, I really need something green, they will eat it. On a Monday, my son will eat five pieces of asparagus. The next Monday, he tells me it's the worst asparagus on the planet. Because his body is t dictating his hunger. And what he really wants is like a potato. It's crazy. It's crazy talk. Our bodies know what it needs. Provide variety. Begin to challenge that for yourself. There's foods that you don't let yourself eat. Maybe give it a try. See what comes up for you. Um, see what your thoughts are. Find countercultural friends. I have good friends in the field. I'm, I'm lucky. I, I, I specialize in eating disorders. I'm also in recovery, so I've got great friends who, who know my brain and kind of the crazy that is there around some things. But I have good friends, you know, some of my best friends are registered dietitians, so I'm super lucky. And we actually go to events together, and one of them and I are in a small group together at church. So it's great, because she and I usually sit next to each other, because we're countercultural. We, we don't 
talk about food the same way some of our other friends do. And it's nice for me to have her there. It's nice for me to have her to laugh about how, how crazy it can get, how easily we can go nuts, like I said, over cookies and brownies, um, those kind of things, or Taco Bell. So celebrate failures. Learn to be wrong and to laugh at yourself. Who likes to fail? Exactly. Nobody wakes up. We all would say failure is good, but when's the last time you tried something that you're terrible at and laughed when you failed? When's the last time you tried something new that you know you're not going to be any good at? I'm trying to think. I made a headboard. That was exciting. So that was a new skill for me. But it's hard. We don't want to fail. It, it leans into our own isms. Trying new things with your kids. Trying new foods with your kids. Now that's fun. Your palms might be sweaty. Their palms are sweaty. Something a little crazy like Indian cuisine. I don't know. Have some fun. Try some things. Fail. Laugh at yourself. Seek your own help. Becky touched on this. It's not because we're counselors. You don't have to come see us. Just seek your own help. It's really important. The longer I've been in the field, the more I would say that when parents call me to work with their teenagers, I typically and rarely take that teenager on without knowing that the mom and dad are doing their own work. Because it's really hard for me to work all, you know, do things that are different with a teenager and just put them back in without the parents having done their own work as well. So seek your own help. Help is not a dirty word. Um, it really isn't. And then seek balance. We are an unbalanced culture, really and truly. Um, I joke that counseling is the only place that we really want you to be average. True, think about it. In my business, if you eat too much, that's a problem. If you're too sad, that's a problem. If you drink too much, that's a problem. If you work too much, right? If you don't work enough, that's a problem. If you don't eat enough, also a problem. It's the only place that we're like, we just want you right in the middle. Just average. Just be a duck. I heard somebody say that one time. Just be a duck. Get in line and be a duck. Make your con contribution and move on. And we don't do that in this culture. We're terrified of going, hey, I can be in the middle and still really contribute and have purpose and meaning in my world. Because you can. They both can exist. So balance is defined. It's a condition in which different elements are equal or in the correct proportions. A habit of calm behavior or judgment. People who have balance are non-reactive. They're typically very calm. They're not going to run around and try to fix it immediately. Maybe they're going to gather a little more information. Calm. Seeking the middle road. That's one of the best things you can do. I, I looked up, I will say, I did look up balance in the Urban Dictionary, and it was all about alcohol after you're drunk and getting back on balance. I thought, well, that doesn't apply. <laughs> so, moving on. And there you go. So apparently that word's been hijacked. Um, here's some of our resources which are on there. And, oh, good. Look at that. The, the titles are spelled out. I'm so happy about that. Um, so take a look at some of these things. Um, I think we've got some, yeah, books by Brene Brown. Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. Has anybody read that or heard of it? It's actually a really good book about the unconscious when we're talking about kids being emotional vacuum cleaners. It, it explains the idea that really communication is actually only 10% verbal. Your minds, as you're watching me, you're picking up on all my nonverbals. 100%, which is my body and my tone. Kids do the same thing. So you can look at your child and go, oh, mommy is not, mommy doesn't think she's fat. And your kid's like, yeah, that's not true. <laughs> You're at the gym, you know. You, if you miss the gym, I hear you talk about how you miss the gym and you can't believe you missed the gym. I know that's not true. So they, they pay attention to your nonverbals. That's 90% of what you communicate is your nonverbal. That's a scary number, but it's true. So, so that's the end. We are going to open it up for questions at this point. Is that right? And we have 22 minutes according to the clock. Okay. If you don't have questions, I'll just keep talking. I'm just kidding. I'll just clarify real, real quickly. We do have these handouts, obviously, that you all, some, um, followed your presentation, but we'll make sure that this entire 25 slide presentation is on our website too. So it will complement um, the video that we'll put up there. 
So just to make a clarification. Sorry for any confusion. Would anybody like to ask a question? Um, oh, we have to come up. Sorry. Well, did, would you mind? Oh, not at all. Not here, yeah. Catch me on TV with all my physical. <laughs> awesome. Um, so my question is, I have a five-year-old boy, and um, one of the things I've noticed is when I'm dressing, or he's like, "Oh, why are you wearing that?" Or I see this lady wearing this at school, this lady, this teacher wearing this. So my question is, you know, as a mother, how do you positively influence a boy? That is a great question. My son's only four and a half, so I'm, I, I can't I, I would say, again, you look back at the actions, and, and the fact that he's talking to you or asking you questions, that's a real, that's a gift. Because on some level, he knows he can ask you things. And I, if he's saying, well, why are you wearing that? What, and not in a mean way, one of my favorite things to say to even my four-year-old is, well, what do you think about that? Oh, well, you must think that's appropriate. Because we use words like, is that an appropriate outfit? And, you know, he'll see things on TV, and we, we dialogue about that. And so he'll come up with his answers. So asking him, why do you think I'm wearing that? And being able to, again, look at how you dress and think, okay, is this, as a mom, is this what I would consider to be the best and most appropriate? Do I feel like I'm in integrity in how I'm presenting myself? Or do I feel like I'm trying to dress younger or older or trendier or frumpier or whatever it might be that we might do um, to try to communicate things. But to be able to say, do I feel good about how I am? And just being able to say, well, mommy likes this. Mommy and mommy feels good in this outfit or mommy likes this. Do you have? Yeah, I was going to say with little ones when they're still in that very concrete phrase too, just being curious. Um, I know with my five-year-old daughter, a lot of times I have to fight through my, all the perceptions that come up from, from me about her questions. And I need to sort of shelve those and just get curious with her, like about the fat coat. Um, what is that? What do you mean? And just asking more questions. So, what do you think? What do you think about what I'm wearing? I, I do think it's such it's so different with little boys, which is why um, I'm learning every day with my little guy too. But just being able to push through everything that comes up for me and getting curious with them, so that I can hear more about what's going on with their thought processes first, and then you get to come back and shuffle through all of your own perceptions? That's a good question. That was a hard question. I wanted to ask if there is a family member that has like an allergy to a certain food, how do you handle that? In That's a good one. We discussed that before we even came this morning too. Um, food allergies are either on the rise and a lot, you know, we're not going to get into the history of what's been happening with the creation of food for the past 20 years or so. But it's also becoming a catch-all phrase. So I want to be really careful with my answer here. Um, I think one of the things that we as professionals want to see is to ensure that that allergy has been diagnosed by a reputable doctor of some sort. Again, like Angie was talking about, no, no internet diagnoses for ADHD, and we feel the same way about food allergies. Um, we have friends across our, in our neighborhood who have a son with celiac, and so conversation about food gets difficult. Um, and I know that one of the things you have to do is to, to be careful not to uh, feel sorry for the child who, who actually does have an allergy, and I can't stress that enough, that it cannot be parent-diagnosed. Um, you know, I don't want to be gluten-free, and therefore everyone in my family also has some gluten intolerance, and so we're all gluten-free, and we're all allergic to gluten. Um, but to really be cautious with that language again, because we go back to everything we said about not creating a sense of fear and obsession when it comes to food, um, and yet I want to be respectful to the fact that there are legitimate food allergies out there. So don't hear me say that I don't believe in food allergies. You have a couple thoughts on that too? You want to punt on that one? <laughs> I, I would say just caution about fearfulness when it comes to food. Fearfulness, obsession, etc. Thank you. I talk loud. I don't need to get up for the microphone. But um, I guess probably all of us struggle with our kids eating dinner at night and always craving that dessert. And just my husband and I were raised differently. He always had dessert after dinner, and I rarely had dessert growing up after dinner. So 
we tend to have desserts every night after dinner now, you know, to please the family, but there seems to be this always struggle for if you don't eat all your dinner, then you can't have the dessert, and I really struggle with, am I causing her to overeat beyond her capacity of comfortableness to get the sugar, the, the ice cream, the cupcake, and it is such an internal struggle, and, and my husband and I talk about it all the time, do we just say we're not doing desserts anymore, or do we, so we try to just start saying, eat a few more bites of your dinner, and then you can have half of a cupcake, or finding a balance of, we don't want to make her crazy for the cupcake, and we don't want to keep her from the cupcake, you know what I mean? <laughs> She's struggling well. <laughs> struggling well. Love it. Um, that's also that's a great question. There's a, probably a million answers. So I, what I'll do is tell you my professional perspective. Um, and it's based out of a book that I've listed called Intuitive Eating. I think it's probably the only book I would recommend um, around food. Because what it does is it talks a lot about the genetic imprint of the body and trusting the body and those kind of things. So I think there's a lot of different directions you guys could go. You could negotiate, you and your spouse, on how many desserts you want to have. You could begin to negotiate. What I heard is, you know, ice cream and cupcakes versus, you know, having a bowl of Sour Patch Kids and they can have one Sour Patch. I mean, it's going to satiate them. Um, you changing things up or a fruit that's the dessert, calling that the dessert, um, using that language. So I think that's, you know, you can have kind of more variety in your dessert choices. Um, choose a dessert that may not be real popular for kids. Bread pudding. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I didn't eat that until I was in my 30s. I was like, what is this? It's slimy. It's gross. You know, flan. Um, <laughs> jello. Uh, you know, having a lot of variety so it's not just that real, you know, high sugary one. So that's kind of one, kind of that, you know, looking at some negotiation, trying some things, making it a joke in your family, like, oh, okay, we're trying some new things tonight, and we're going to have a new conversation about desserts. Um, another avenue would be to take your hands off of it. And if they eat a bite of lasagna and they want a cupcake, let them have the cupcake. And then just wait and see if their body corrects. And in the morning, what they start craving. That's kind of another, that's a scarier one for most parents. But that's another area to go. What if their body is saying they want something different um, than what I'm providing? And maybe what their body doesn't, maybe what their body wants is whatever is in that cupcake or that ice cream, um, for whatever reason. I have a dietitian who's a friend of mine. Her children, for a long time, she'd let them eat cookies for breakfast. And she said people would look at her like she was crazy. And her kids are normal weight, healthy, active, happy kids. But she, as a dietitian, was a whole lot more equipped to handle her emotions and understanding the science of food than probably even I am. I joke I know enough about nutrition to be really dangerous. So I use registered dietitians that are trained in eating disorders. Um, but I would say that based on kind of your nonverbals, the negotiating with your husband might be the best way to go and even beginning to make it fun and kind of dialoguing about it or having a dessert-free night one night a week or whatever might be trying to find the balance. So it's not we get dessert all the time or we have these particular desserts every time, but we have this big variety of dessert. So, okay, good question. Yes. Can I just shout it as um, well? Yeah, and I can repeat the question back oh, into okay. the microphone. I've been trying to think about exactly how to ask this, but because I grew up on fast food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and had a lot of health consequences, a lot of them, because of that. Since then, you know, organic, and so I eat healthy, and I cook for my family, and I talk a lot about that. So where is the line? Because I was interested to see that's one of the possible now eating disorders coming up. I don't, I don't want to mess them up and, you know, overemphasize this, but I noticed the other day we're in the, the grocery store, and my son was like, oh, Lucky Charms, I want some of those. I was like, oh, no, baby, too many chemicals. Right. And I thought, uh, but I, love, I wanted some Lucky Charms, too. <laughs> because they are good. Yeah, they're colorful. That's what I tell people all the time. My clients will be like, oh my gosh, I didn't know Chick-fil-A was this good. I'm like, it is. Oh, it is. <laughs> Yummy. And I love Taco Bell. But, so, I, you know, so now I'm just concerned. I didn't know where do you think that line is. Because I want them to eat it healthy. They love Brussels sprouts. They blah, blah, blah. And I cook and we have a lot of fun. 
but my daughter is also very anxiety prone, right. perfectionist prone, and I don't want her thinking things are off limits. I don't know. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. But it seems like your your wheels are starting to spin. Basically, the question is I, being raised on fast food, having some health consequences, and now feeling like maybe you're trying to right your ship by being overly, quote unquote, organic, pos you know, looking at that orthorexia a little bit, going, mm -hmm. okay, it's a little well, uncomfortable. Can I go in there? I don't want to mm -hmm. go there, but sure. what's the... And so, and then, so what's the balance between that? And again, my professional mind is to begin, even for you, it, it really might actually be good for you to meet with a dietitian, a registered dietitian, that, that could do some basic education for you to help, because it sounds like you got some mixed messages about food and your brain is trying to sort it out. And dietitians are a great, great way to begin to even start to think about the chemicals in food, because um, that's a big fear, right? We know they're in there. And I had a dietitian one time say, I mean, they're all approved. I mean, our body can detox those out like that, no problem. The majority of us, excuse me, 98% thereabouts, they, they can't put them in if they're not. Um, and so dietitians are going to understand the science and maybe even be able to talk you through some of the science a little better about the things that we're scared of. And then I think for you beginning to figure out how do I maybe, you know, if you love Taco Bell and Lucky Charms, how do I maybe reintroduce Lucky Charm like products into my world again um, and beginning to, to do that with yourself because it, it, it's, it's hard to seek a balance. If you're only eating Lucky Seed, you were raised over here, right? Only fast food. Well, there, that's, not, that's not balanced, that's not moderation. And then you go I'll over eat here. Lucky Charms, and I'll eat the Taco Bell, but only when my kids can't see me. There you go. <laughs> um, thank you. I, mean, I love your honesty. Can we just have a round of applause? Like, for a super So maybe next time, maybe next time, take them on the Taco Bell run and, and and talk about it. How old is your daughter? She's eight. Eight. You can begin to talk a little bit about your history and maybe where your own fear comes from. Because what it'll do is she'll go, oh, I thought mom's fear was because she didn't want me to be fat. Yeah. See, that's what kids kids are self centered. It's how they survive childhood. It is all about them. Yeah. But. You, in reality, have fear about these things because of a history. I just don't want her to be sick. Yeah, you don't want her to get sick. <laughs> so it's not about fat, it's about sick. Yeah. Or feel yucky or have side, you know, some of the side effects. So he, what I want you to hear is you weren't, I mean, and by no means when I say balance, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying Lucky Charms every day. Um, I believe if you had Lucky Charms three meals a day, you would absolutely get tired of them. And you wouldn't, you'd be able to have choice over them to a degree, but that's not what we're shooting for. We're shooting for balance. And balance is Brussels sprouts and Lucky Charms. Weird, right? Maybe not together. That might be a weird food combination and or ritual. So. Just FYI. And we're gonna go, um, I saw this one, and then this question, and then that question. Um, I have way too many questions, so I'll probably just need to make an appointment. But my, <laughs> and I'm not a Nazi mom when it comes to food, but I have, as my kids have gotten older, and we have gone through food struggles, because I do have a child that has been diagnosed needing to be really free, and that kind of got me on this whole thing. Um, I don't trust the FDA. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really don't. Um, I just recently, um, I, I'm on the EWG, whether or not people really know about this group or not, but I do think that they are working for us. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, BHT has been this big thing, and I was like, what is BHT? And I started doing research on it, and I'm like, oh my God, it's in every cereal on the, on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And my kids eat cereal for breakfast, they come home and want it for a snack. If they ate it in moderation, but I was like, I, I've got to get this out of my house, and so I had to research foods, and so my kids go in the pantry, and they're like, what happened to all of our cereal? I'm like, we're eating this cereal now. Yes. Well, why? And I'm like, because it has chemicals in it that was bad for you. Right. So I try to explain why I'm doing the things I'm doing because, you know, well, we can't trust our government. But I don't know if that's damaging to them to say, I want you to eat healthy because cancer is on the rise and we're not sure why all these people are getting these weird things. And it could be because of all this stuff that's in our foods that they allow that. I mean, BHT is made from petroleum. We don't need to be eating anything that's made from petroleum. So I don't know. I'm like... 
I, you know, I don't, I don't, so I, I want to find a good balance because I don't want to damage my children because they're very impressionable ages of nine, eight, and eight. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where that balance is, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, are you saying just as long as you explain your knowledge behind it and this is why we're doing this because mom thinks it's probably healthier for you and mom yeah. wants you to be healthy? Right. Well, and here's what I would, I would eliminate words like healthy and maybe just say, hey, this is where I am today. I mean, at the end of the day, if you find that you go, okay, this, with any parenting issue, this is kind of a global concept, but if you've got something, this is the hill you're gonna die on, like if you're gonna die, like you're going, this is the hill I'm dying on today, your position might change, in t I mean, in 10 years they might come out and go, oh, we were wrong, BHT actually makes you a genius. And you're like, why? Right? <laughs> okay. So I, don't, I doubt it if it's petroleum based, <laughs> but I don't know, <laughs> okay. But if it's your position, I, I would avoid those words like healthy. Those are big buzzwords. And be able to say, hey, you know, guys, at the end of the day, this is, this is where I'm landing. And, and I could be wrong. I'm very open to, as mom, I could be misinformed and wrong. And I am open. I'm researching. I'm having conversation about this. I'm willing to explore this. Today, as your mom, this is the boundary. And when you're 18 go to college, Go for it. Eat those Fruit Loops. But that's what I would, and I wouldn't make it about, I want you to be healthy. Because that makes it about them versus letting it be about you. And I think every parent in here, as a parent, we have the right to have the hills we're going to die on. And we don't really have to have great reasons other than this is, this is where I am today. So, and balance, I heard the kind of subtext of what is balance. Balance is different for every family and every person. And so what you're teaching your kids, hopefully, is how to, to be balanced, not just with food, but with everything. So it's a good question. But again, if it's your position, you get to have it. Um, I'm not familiar with the group Becky is, so that's good. I'll find out more. Um, but that's what I would say. And allow it to not be about health. Just be about, hey, this is your, I'm your mom. This is, what I'm, this is where I am. But you want to be careful about the hills you're going to die on. If you die on every hill, you're going to be very tired <laughs> and dead. I just want to thank both of you for coming here and being so authentic in front of us because I think in our community we don't have that very often. And just listening to you speak makes me realize that it starts with me. And here I am in an extra, extra large shirt today. And I realize now that my 15-year-old daughter is I'm getting in her older brother's closet wearing XXL shirts to school. And this is all stuff that I hadn't really, I mean, I thought about if I, and, you know, I have to worry about the GPA before I worry about the food. But really this all, it's not really about the food. It all starts with us and our thinking and how we're talking to them and being open. And I thank you for that because we all need to hear that message. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just second start by saying that we've got kids at the high school and you wouldn't believe the girls wear oversized shirts. Mm -hmm. They're like this big, but that's a trend. And I'm like, why? But but one started it, and they all do it now. But thank you for bringing that to light. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, my question is, I'm just curious, how would you recommend speaking to young children mm -hmm. about food? Because I agree with you that mm -hmm. things should not be necessarily off limits. But you know, we have to provide some limits for our yes. kids but you don't want to do that to the detriment of so, so how do you recommend speaking to young children about food? And I have a two, four, and six-year-old. Two, four, and six, okay. Well, and the six and two are obviously in different cognitive right. functioning right. stages. Four, okay, yes. Um, again, I, uh, here's what I, I want to alleviate that pressure that you're going to say something that's going to cause, right. Right. you know, these things. So, so you get to try, it's almost when you can really let yourself off the hook as a parent. And when somebody goes, I don't want to screw up my kid, my first thought is always like, well, you're going to, so let's just set that aside. <laughs> you know, I'm a therapist. I'm married to a therapist. I mean, my child has no chance in this world. Um, I mean, and I'm a recovered addict. I mean, we're nuts, okay? So I'm just like, great. So I can let myself off the hook, and I can try some different approaches. And so that's what I would say is maybe research some books. Um, there's some great books that will give you parenting principles about just talking um, love and logic, um, how to speak to your, how to talk so your kids will listen and listen so your kids will talk. Because the goal is to say, okay, I've got my limits and you, you get to have your feelings about them, but let's be able to dialogue about the feelings about that. And my limits may change. 
because as parents, we do change our positions quite a bit on things. Um, so, and one of the things I do with my four-year-old, because he's right in the middle of your two, two and six, is, um, you know, he'll want to eat. He had tricks the other morning, and I'll go, okay, we well, had tricks yesterday, so today let's try something different. Mm -hmm. And he'll go, oh, no, I want tricks. And I'll be great, you can have tricks tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Or you can have them for a snack. Right. But today for breakfast, let's do something different. You have some oatmeal or banana bread or mm -hmm. an egg. And he's like, okay, I'll do the banana bread. I'm like, okay. And that's just kind of how we talk about the limits quickly. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I'd probably send you to sources that are going to give you more principles about talking to kids that age versus a specific. Okay. And if you need me to tell you those after, I can. Was there anyone else? Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thank you for your honesty.